Hi everyone, this is Dr. Stefan. Welcome to Interstitial Lung Disease Info. In this episode, I'd like to discuss whether, well, to answer the question whether a CT scan is necessary to diagnose pulmonary fibrosis. It's one of the comments that I got on the channel. And this is the year 2024. So actually, the field of interstitial lung diseases, of these conditions that affect the tissue of the lung, that may lead to scarring of the lung, this field has advanced tremendously in recent years. However, you may have heard about the diagnosis of pulmonary fibrosis or lung scarring, even in people who may be older. So this would be in the pre-CT scan era. So what's going on? Do we really need these scans or not? So basically, if we're trying to characterize the interstitial lung disease very, very precisely, as we should in 2024, we generally need a CT scan. And it's not just any CT scan. We need something called a high-resolution chest CT scan, without contrast. So this is basically a type, a protocol of scanning the chest. So when someone lies on the table that goes through the donut shaped machine, that's the CT scanner, the radiologist needs to use a very specific acquisition protocol to get those images of your chest within the machine and the computer to be analyzed and looked at later. So what we're talking about high resolution, when we're saying high resolution CT scan, we're looking at images that are very, very close to each other. So the CT scan is a cross-sectional image of the chest. So basically we're seeing as if we're seeing slices through the chest, for lack of a better word. But the thing is, in a high resolution scan, those slices are very, very close to each other, maybe one millimeter apart or something like that. So I'm just saying one word. It could be a different, different size of slice, but we're talking about very, very close uh, to each other slices because we're trying to see the fine detail of the lung tissue. That detail will actually tell us what the pattern of scarring is if there is lung scarring. So a normal x-ray is basically just a picture of the lungs. It doesn't have that high resolution. So that's, that's just the word that I wanted to put out there. So that's why when we're looking for pulmonary fibrosis, generally if we see it on a chest x-ray, it's possible that it looks a lot worse on the CT scan because that's a much higher resolution. So it will detect a lot of other things. So if there is pulmonary fibrosis, it will tell us not only that there is pulmonary fibrosis, but it will tell us a lot about what that pulmonary fibrosis looks like where it's located in the lungs, is it more towards the top, the, the bottom on both sides, does it affect the outer parts of the lungs, does it kind of, um, is it predominant in the bottom versus the top, so all these little patterns are telling us something. And then there are specific patterns on the CT scan that have been very closely associated with what is going on if we're actually looking at a lung biopsy. So this is something very, very important because in the year 2024, we've moved off, moved away a little bit from getting lung biopsies to diagnose subtypes of interstitial lung disease. There is a role for lung biopsy in some cases which are disputable. We're not really sure how to classify them. The patient is really young. It may change the management of the case. That's when we may consider a lung biopsy. But for straightforward cases where we have specific patterns, for example, the UIP pattern, usual interstitial pneumonia pattern, if we see that on this chest CT scan, we can be fairly confident that that will be the pattern that will be on the pathology as well. And these terms can be quite confusing, but that just means in practical terms that that patient may not need to have a lung biopsy to have a very fairly confident diagnosis of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, for example, if the right clinical circumstances are there as well. So for example, the person is maybe in their 70s, they don't have any rheumatological disease that could explain the findings, no exposures to anything in the environment that may have triggered the, the problem in the lungs, things like that. So if we have the compatible imagery on the radiology, on the chest CT scan, Alongside with the clinical characterization of the case, maybe someone who has been seen by a specialist, they know what they're looking for, we don't have to do further testing. So that's really good because these people can then get on treatment to slow down the progress of the scarring without necessarily having biopsies and other invasive procedures, which can actually be quite risky in some situations when there is significant scarring of the lungs. So the CT scan is really useful. It can also tell us, for example, whether someone has a lot of inflammation. We say inflammation because there are some patterns of interstitial lung diseases that are associated with things that look not just like scars, but maybe there is some sort of a fluffy appearance of the lungs, for lack of a better term again, 
that might suggest inflammation. So we're thinking about maybe things like ground glass changes. You may read this on the report. So if we have extensive ground glass change, again, we may think that there may be a reaction, an inflammatory reaction. The immune system of that particular person reacting to something that's from the environment or maybe in the context of an autoimmune, a rheumatological condition that's triggering the lung problem. So then we may want to treat with an anti-inflammatory drug or medication such as corticosteroids, immunosuppressants in the first instance or treat the underlying cause, the rheumatological condition or maybe remove the exposure from the environment. Maybe it's birds, maybe it's, I don't know, moldy hay or anything like that because that can actually stabilize the condition in many cases without the need of other treatments and we may prevent progression to actual scarring because the inflammation eventually if it goes unchecked it may lead to further scarring so then it gives us a lot of information so someone a ct scan done at this point in time with the evidence that we have available in the hands of a specialist a good radiologist who knows what they're looking for in the context of potentially a multidisciplinary team discussion where the pulmonologist sits down with the radiologist and they talk through the case they may actually come up with a lot of things that may change the management of the case, whether treatment is necessary, whether that uh, um, scarring that they see on the lungs looks like it may progress. They may make treatment decisions. They may uh, suggest that you avoid lung biopsy, for example, if that may be risky. So a lot of information can be gained from just looking at a good quality, high-resolution chest CT scan when diagnosing pulmonary fibrosis. Now, obviously... Sometimes one CT scan is not enough. That's the other thing, because in some cases, we need to see whether the fibrosis is actually getting worse. If your symptoms have been very, very stable, things are not getting worse, but maybe your doctor suspects that the scarring, the way it looks like, may, may progress. They may recommend that you repeat the scan. So that's something that's not unusual, because we're trying to determine whether the scar tissue in the lung is getting worse despite your initial first-line therapy treatment or just over time without therapy because if that's the case again you may be eligible for anti-scarring or anti-fibrotic medication to slow that process down and basically buy time so that's really really important so we may have to do one scan or maybe we may need to repeat the scans now the caveat to all of this and the nuance that comes with all of this is that we need to be really really mindful that we don't just do scans for the sake of doing scans because they do carry a risk of in themselves because we're getting a high dose of radiation when we're doing the scans. Now, scanners have improved a lot in recent years. So the actual amount of radiation that someone receives from a modern scanner in 2024 has reduced significantly. So the modern scanners have a lot of detectors. They don't need as much radiation to work very well. So, so that's something that you may want to keep in mind if you're really, really afraid of having scans. So if you need to have a scan, by all means, if your doctor thinks that you should have a scan, you should do that. But what I'm trying to say is that you probably shouldn't have scan just for, a scan just for the sake of checking your lungs. There are better ways to do that. I think the first thing would be to maybe go and check with your doctor whether there is a lung problem. So if you're worried about your lungs, about your lung health, go have a consultation with a pulmonologist. Have a discussion with them. Explain what your symptoms are. Maybe the doctor will listen to your chest. And if they hear certain sounds, for example, when they listen to your chest, they may be more inclined to do that scan. And it may be more helpful because they can correlate what they're listening when they're putting the stethoscope in your chest with what they see on the scan. So it's always useful to go to the doctor first and then do the tests if that's possible. I know in some cases, in some countries, you can just go and get a scan done, but it's important that you know what type of scan to get. So like I said before, if you're looking for pulmonary fibrosis, having a scan, for example, that's low resolution, maybe with contrast on board, because sometimes you may get that, it's not the right scan to assess for the presence of pulmonary fibrosis for lung scarring. So that's why I'm encouraging everyone who's watching this channel to go and have a conversation with the doctor first to make sure that you're getting the right imaging technique done. So I don't think I'm going to drone on with this video, but if you have further comments, do put them down in the comment section below. I look at them. I apologize. I've been away for a while. I'm traveling a lot extensively so and cannot do these videos. Unfortunately, I'm not a full-time YouTuber. I also have an actual job as a, as a doctor and researcher. So by all means, if you have other questions, do put them down in the comment sections below and I'll try and make as many of these clips as I can. All the best and good health.